So yes, I'm uh, Chris Smith. I'm VP of Engineering at Ticketmaster, uh, focused on data science, uh, doing a lot of the data architecture and infrastructure for Ticketmaster. Uh, but enough about me, because I'm probably the most boring part of this talk. We'll just go to the, the good stuff, right? So I'm hoping everybody here recognizes this logo and knows what Ticketmaster does uh, in the general case. So I'm not going to get into a lot of specifics there, but maybe you've all bought tickets before, as I hope you all have bought tickets before. Um, but the best way to describe what we do at a very, very high level for the one person who hasn't bought a ticket for a concert before is we do fun at scale. That's that's basically what we're about, selling, selling tickets at a big scale. We are the preeminent uh, ticketing platform for North America and around the world. So this is the first uh, time that Ticketmaster had a distributed system. It was in 1977. So we've been doing this for a very long time. You can imagine uh, AWS was pretty terrible in 1977. Google Cloud, also terrible service. Azure, I don't think it had any uptime at all in 1977. Um, so yeah, we, we had to build out our own infrastructure, built our own uh, uh, data centers, uh, did our own hardware, uh, did our own operating systems, did our own software. We're, we're very much a technology company because we're the first ones doing a lot of things in the ticketing space. Um, so, that's great, we were doing all this data center stuff, but then the cloud presented itself as this wonderful opportunity for us. Um, and this is basically the, the story of how we went to the cloud and how we engaged uh, the public cloud. Uh, and yes, it was very much like herding cats. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, this is a metaphor for how, how the migration went internally in Ticketmaster, but it's also a pretty good representation of Ticketmaster's business. If you really want the big secret on how to be the preeminent ticketing system in the world. It doesn't require a lot of special backroom deals or anything like that. It just requires never saying no to your customers. Um, you just, everybody in the entertainment industry wants to do something unique that no one else has done. That's pretty much the whole point of putting on a show is to give somebody a, or present everybody a unique experience and we're part of that experience and so everybody wants something different than what everybody else has. Uh, and as a consequence, we have to take all those cats trying to do their own unique special thing and try to herd them together into a platform that actually works. Um, similarly, that's what I have to do with engineers uh, when we're trying to get into the cloud. Um, so yeah, for context, we had literally decades of development before there was any kind of a cloud of any kind. Uh, so, uh, you know, originally our system was basically a box office machine that literally went into a box office at a venue. Uh, then we migrated to a model in the early uh, mid 90s of having a centralized data center where you could access it over the web. Um, so it was our own cloud, so to speak. Um, and, and it has since progressed all the way to now leveraging the public cloud. Um, but it's a very uh, diverse technology stack. You can think of Ticketmaster Engineering as kind of an archeological journey through 40 years of technology. So if you can think of a technology that existed 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we, and it was reasonably pre preeminent at the time, we're probably using it. Um, so this makes migration into cloud, or really migration to any different infrastructure, uh, significantly more complex. Um, our Initial cloud strategy was very tactical, specific projects, specific uh, groups that were looking to do something that was unlike anything that we had done before at Ticketmaster would go to the cloud because they could execute on something that was unlike our normal service offerings from our infrastructure. And they would just set up an AWS account, do some work, either get the product deployed or shut it down when it was done. Uh, but over time, after multiple of these tactical moves, we recognized that the public cloud was actually pretty strategic for us. Uh, and so we've got, as a consequence, we've got a, the, the root, what most people have in the real world when it comes to their uh, multi-cloud setup, which is you have this initial set of tactical decisions you made that helps you to learn enough to figure out what your actual strategy ought to be. Uh, but we still have the leftovers, the vestiges of those tactical decisions lingering around in your infrastructure. And we certainly have that. Um, strategically, 
uh, we chose to go uh, with a strategic uh, cloud provider, which was AWS. Um, but as uh, Mike Schindel was talking about yesterday, the reality is uh, even if you try to go to exactly one cloud provider, you end up using multiple cloud providers. It's just kind of inevitable uh, in, in the process, and that is the reality that, that we have right now. We use Google Cloud for especially most of our marketing uh, infrastructure. Um, we also uh, have bits of Azure for various projects. There's probably uh, four or five different cloud providers if I dig through the entire stack. So we have a, a, a multi-cloud reality, but we're very much operating from a strategic cloud partner kind of uh, architecture, so it's not full-on multi-cloud. Everything is in every cloud provider kind of strategy. Um, so let's get to the good stuff early. Let's air the dirty laundry. Let's talk about uh, all the things that went wrong. This is the stuff that probably is going to help educate you guys as much of uh, you know, all of the mistakes that I made. That I, that's how I learn. And hopefully, I can share some of those mistakes, and you can learn uh, from those mistakes. Um, and, and the good news is a lot of these mistakes were made in more of that tactical setting I was describing. So by the time that we'd figured out a strategy, um, we had learned the lesson, and we didn't, at a grand scale, screw everything up. Um, but I can't really say that was true about all of this. Um, so the first one uh, is, uh, the first mistake was manual provisioning. So when you have your own data center, the process of provisioning new hardware is tends to be fairly manual unless you've got like something fancy like open compute or one of those uh, one of those racks that's preset and ready for software software defined networks and all that loveliness uh, and you know none of that stuff existed 30 years ago so our traditional approach to provisioning was fairly manual which made it somewhat okay to have a somewhat manual way of provisioning and deploying software um, and people followed that habit when they went into the cloud. Uh, and that's obviously a bad decision. Everybody tells you not to do it. Um, but it's amazing uh, the con how much that takes away from many of the advantages of the cloud. It really hampered agility. It really hampered our ability to iterate. Uh, it hampered our uh, ability to understand and diagnose problems uh, and to triage problems. And it really became difficult to know, hey, is this a problem with us or is it a problem with the cl our cloud provider, for example? Um, so don't do that. I think everybody will tell you that anyway. Um, the, other, the other thing that we didn't do initially was have a single sign-on mechanism for working with our cloud provider. So now everything goes through our uh, existing single sign-on stack, uh, which simplifies manning, managing all of the credentials and access uh, to our cloud. But originally we had individual access keys that were passed around to individual employees uh, and they sort of spread like, I don't know, weeds would be the best way to describe it. And I have to do a lot of weed whacking to clear all that stuff out. Because of course, some of the stuff that you give to developers somehow ends up getting deployed into production code even though that's not supposed to happen. It just will happen, right? That, that's the reality. Um, the other mistake that we made was committing to putting everything in AWS. And, and by everything, I mean, not even a hybrid cloud strategy. I mean a all-in-one cloud provider strategy. That was something that, at one point, uh, a bunch of consultants advised us was a good call. Not a good call. <laughs> I'll save you a lot of time on that. Um, it's just not a good call. Um, it, it's one thing to have a strategic partner, uh, which is what we've done, where, where you know, having to deal with all of the abstraction and layers of indirection of trying to be truly agnostic to your cloud provider might not be worth the investment, depending on your context. Uh, but committing wholeheartedly to running in the cloud, uh, it turns out that not every square peg fit, fits in that round hole, would be the best way to think about it. Um, another sort of smaller mistake that we made, and, and honestly, I don't know that a mistake is the right way to think about it, uh, because it did have its advantages, was um, every single VPC and every single account that we had was linked to our on-prem infrastructure through a VPN, uh, which meant that they weren't linked to each other. And as a consequence, uh, any time any two projects that were working in different environments had to interact with each other, it traversed over what amounts to a single point of failure, which was the VPN link, right? Uh, and aside from it being a single point of failure, it's also a not terribly uh, great uh, performance. It 
performance characteristics are terrible because you're adding a ton of latency to things that should actually have almost no latency. Um, we'll, we can get back to that a little bit later. Um, the other mistake that we made was we failed to work out uh, really detailed and transparent on-prem uh, cost metrics. So we had our private cloud, and it was fairly easy for people to deploy and operate in the private cloud, and it had some reasonably well-understood properties and behaviors, uh, and it was pretty well supported. We knew if there was a problem with our on-prem cloud and where the problem was, and we could diagnose and respond to it, all the things that you hope for a private cloud, um, and or really any cloud. Uh, but we hadn't really done a detailed breakdown of cost for all of the resources that any given product was using inside our private cloud. We knew exactly how much our private cloud in total cost to operate, uh, and we knew how each of the different, you know, how much is server cost, how much a switch cost, all that. We we're obviously doing the accounting on that part. Um, but when you think about a particular virtual machine with a particular software stack or a particular collection of virtual machines or uh, even just uh, some log files somewhere, what were those costing to operate. Uh, we didn't have transparency on that, and that proves to be uh, a big issue once you're starting to go into the hybrid cloud uh, environment because of the fact that you want to make smart tactical decisions about whether it is better to run software in your private cloud or in the public cloud, and cost is a huge factor in that. If you don't pay attention uh, and you put software in the wrong bucket, it will cost sometimes orders of magnitude more than putting it in the right bucket. And you can't know that if you don't know both prices, right? You can guess, you can speculate, but you won't really know what the cost is. And you can have some very unfortunate discoveries that you come to later. Uh, but more importantly, it makes it hard for you to reason of, hey, should we prioritize putting this project in the cloud? Should we not? It turns out cost is a really, you know, one of like about three other factors that you need to seriously consider when you're making that decision. Um, the other thing that we uh, did that's that sort of that whole right column there is we deferred making decisions uh, or solving particular problems, uh, thinking that we would get to them later. Uh, and this was, these were more strategic decisions. Uh, we, we felt like service discovery was, uh, you know, a lot of additional complexity. Orchestration was definitely a lot of additional complexity. And when we were doing this, there was, weren't even a lot of really good orchestration frameworks that were designed to work in a hybrid cloud environment. Um, we deferred working on serverless, and we also deferred working on training, which in hindsight seems particularly short-sighted, uh, but there was a hope or expectation that we would um, learn enough through partnership and also engineers who already had prior experience, um, uh, and therefore training would be something that we could do more tactically once we understood what aspects we needed to train people on versus which ones we didn't need to train people on. Um, in, in hindsight, that was particularly terrible. But also, the other ones were terrible as well, because while there is some additional complexity with learning how to deal with uh, service discovery and orchestration and serverless, if you don't deal with those problems, you effectively um, add complexity for your operations and how you manage your cloud later on. because. All of those pieces give you a layer of indirection on top of your cloud platform, right? So uh, simple, simple example, service discovery, right? If I need to talk to a database, right, uh, that's great. Um, I need to talk to this database. I know the name of the database. I will connect to the database. Fantastic. Um, but now if I want to do a cloud migration, if I forget to update that configuration, I might be talking to a database that's in a different data center from where my code is. And there's really no need for that risk to even exist because the right answer is, I want to talk to this database, and that database should be the one that is right next to me in, in my data center, not one in some other data center. Uh, so having that service discovery mechanism makes it very easy to then seamlessly move pieces of the puzzle around uh, and, react, and, and react quickly. Same with orchestration. Uh, and serverless, obviously, is potentially a great simplifier in terms of figuring out even how to deploy uh, into a new environment. So uh, if you ask a uh, developer, hey, we're going to go into AWS, they write some code to go into AWS, and then your first question them before they can even get a machine up and running is, what kind of instance type do you need? What kind of networking <laughs> capabilities do you need? What VPC should you be in? They're looking at you like, 
I didn't have to answer any of these questions before. I just deployed into my data center and it was all taken care of for me. Uh, and serverless is great for that. Serverless takes all those decisions away from that developer. Obviously, there's some people who that's not the right answer. They actually do need to be very specific about the platform they're running on. But the vast majority of uh, projects in a, in a typical company, like 80% of them, they don't care. And this can reduce, therefore, how m much learning that your developers have to go through in order to figure out how to deploy anything. Now, it wasn't all bad. Uh, the wins here are really not going to be surprising to anyone in this audience, so I'm going to um, skip through them quickly. But obviously, we got uh, a lot of nice automation around our infrastructure offerings that we didn't have before. We got a ton of elasticity. That's like the big buzzword with going to a public cloud, right? It's you know, seemingly infinite elasticity. Uh, and one of the nice side effects of having seemingly infinite elasticity is blue cream deploys become much, much more trivial to operate and to manage because you can just pay for some extra infrastructure while you're in the middle of a blue green deploy and then stop paying for it when you're ready to shut it down. Uh, so you can get really careless about, you know, how many mis machines do I need to st stand up and how much capacity do I need to manage this deployment? We would sometimes you know, deploy 100 new servers uh, only for 15 minutes, uh, whereas before trying to manage 100 new servers on-prem on meant a lot of capacity planning and financial capital commitment that we didn't have to make. Uh, and obviously reduce development friction. I mean, probably the biggest win that the engineering group itself realized when moving into the public cloud was just how much more quickly we could iterate and learn. Uh, and, and to that extent, maybe, maybe delaying the training wasn't such a bad decision because we did learn very quickly once we got out in there. So um, let's describe our infrastructure. So uh, as I said, we have a strategic uh, public cloud uh, partner, which is AWS. Um, we do tactically use other clouds, like I said, so, but our uh, infrastructure is built uh, really around our on-prem and AWS linkage. Um, we have regions that pair up, uh, AWS regions that pair up with our on-prem data centers, and they have direct connect links between uh, on-prem and AWS. That's giving us uh, very reliable, low latency, guaranteed bandwidth uh, connections. Uh, and, uh, the one downside with this is that our existing data centers that we were, we were allocated, uh, one of them is in Phoenix, uh, which is actually where uh, Ticketmaster was founded originally, so that's kind of why we're, we're in that data center. And Phoenix isn't close to any particular AWS region, so there was a lot of additional latency on the West Coast that we didn't have on the East Coast, which was something we had to factor in when we were thinking about our strategy for going to the cloud. Um, so this brings us to our architectural goals for when we were trying to go to the cloud, what, was our, what were our key things that we were looking for? And a lot of these weren't really specific to being in the public cloud. They were more driven by organizational priorities. Uh, the big one being availability, uh, which uh, really is code for scalability as well, because if you can't scale, then your services aren't available for people. Uh, so it's really, uh, but, it's, but availability is more precise because what we really want to be able to say is that we are always in business and customers are never turned away because of a failure of a system. Um, and that failure of a system, by the way, could be an AWS region, right? So we don't want to, or, or our data center, right? Um, efficiency was a, another key goal, both uh, in terms of development efficiency, but also in terms of cost efficiencies and execution efficiencies when we operate the scales that we operate, we're relatively uh, working with relatively tight margins, it's very important not to have, uh, to be wasteful uh, in our use of uh, resources. Uh, and then the other one is related to that latency problem I was mentioning is we really wanted to mask latency uh, issues with being, with services being migrated back and forth potentially between on-prem and, and the public cloud, right? So if you're, if you imagine that your infrastructure by definition has a public cloud component and a private cloud component, there is some additional latency that comes from hopping over that link between the two. And as much as possible, you want an architecture that helps mask that latency so that it doesn't actually uh, affect uh, the user's experience. So the question is, what kind of approach helps you to address all of these things? Um, and and digging, digging down a little bit on that latency part, this is the bane of latency everywhere, right? Is Amdahl's law. This, this thing, you know, it, it's a very wise man, Amdahl, and, and he definitely uh, 
highlighted a very important problem in, in distributed computing and parallelism and concurrency. Uh, and the thing that you have to hate about this is the one minus P part of this, okay? Which says that if you can't divide up a task and split it up into component pieces that can be done in parallel, then that task will be the long pull for you getting anything done. Uh, which is another way of saying latency is the hardest problem in software, right? Or, or hardware, depending on how you look at it, in computing, I guess. Um, so you can fight as hard as you want against Amdahl's law, it never breaks. But there is uh, a little bit of a cheat code for it, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later that you can do to mitigate this problem at least somewhat, because uh, otherwise you're stuck with a latency problem. And that goes to a push strategy. Um, you may have seen this kind of strategy have a lot of different names. Uh, I can go through a bunch of them that are all kind of related to this basket. But the basic idea of push is as data arrives, react to it immediately, pre-compute as much as you possibly can, and push out the result as far out as you can from your core system. Um, this ties in a lot of other architectural patterns like event sourcing, where you're basically doing change data capture or uh, posting uh, all of your operations as a sequence of events that can then be aggregated in various uh, data stores or rendered in, in web pages or uh, other persistent uh, structures. Um, you also may have heard terms like complex event processing or event stream processing. Uh, this diagram is terribly unhelpful, but I thought it was indicative of how many different terms we have for basically the same thing. Um, but this is all about processing those events that we were talking about on this event sourcing page, right? So that in-between step between the event log and the aggregates, that's all complex event processing or event stream processing. Um, there's another pattern that's closely related to this model, which is uh, CQRS. How many people here have heard of CQRS? Okay, good, so I do need to explain it. Um, so that stands for, oh, I'm gonna get this wrong now, command, query, uh, responsibility segregation. I always forget the responsibility. Um, and basically what it, what it means is uh, your read path and your write path can be independent paths. They're not necessarily going the same route. Uh, and, and that really amounts to essentially, you could be writing to an event log, but you might be reading from the database, right? And so there's a little bit of asynchrony built into everything. This is not just, uh, so, so this adds a little bit of complexity to your software designs and to your architecture, right? Uh, that's just totally upfront, it adds it. But it's also a way of recognizing the complexity that's intrinsically there once you're basically operating in more than, well, really more than one computer, but particularly more than one data center, because you're going to have to get, um, there's gonna be an interim step where like you've written to a database, but it hasn't been replicated to another database, and you're gonna have to live with that reality. You can try to pretend that reality doesn't exist. All you've done then is basically taking a two-step process and made it so your business can't function properly in the in-between step. It's much easier to take a CQRS approach and say, no, I know that there's this first step and then there's the second step and I'm gonna figure out how to run the business in both states, where only the first step is completed or where both steps are complete. Or more realistically, when you're in our kind of setup uh, where there might be six or seven different steps because there's many different data centers where this data is getting replicated to. Um, and really all this boils down to uh, another term that, that, that's very popular, which is uh, Lambda architecture, which is this whole model of uh, having pure functions that operate on data that could either be a stream or uh, a file or like a batch kind of context, but being able to compose functions together and execute on that. So we've, these were all kind of ideas that we tried to uh, embrace in order to handle this, um, this more distributed environment that we were in than the environment that we had before, where we had a tendency to make a lot of assumptions that really don't bear out in reality, including things like, hey, if I write to the file system on this one machine, then immediately the results are visible in all machines everywhere, right? Which, that requires bending some laws of physics and distorting the time-space continuum, and I'm not really into that stuff. I'd rather just acknowledge reality as it is now. Um, so some key components, some key technologies that we use to build this architecture. Probably one of the more important ones uh, was Kafka. We partnered with Confluent uh, to make this happen. And really this was part of a larger uh, and more ambitious data strategy that was tied into um, data science. Uh, we always had this problem of we're a very large organization with a lot of uh, 
disparate uh, products and businesses uh, all across the world. And the disadvantage of that is every startup or competitor that you might have has a much simpler uh, system and they can iterate much more quickly as a consequence. And the one advantage that you have is there's all this data from all these systems that you can combine and synthesize and to create something that no one else could possibly create because they don't have all that, that diaspora of, of data. Uh, the only problem with that is connecting the dots between all those different pieces can be very complex. Uh, I always think of it as like a N squared problem. If you've got N different technologies that you're trying to connect together, uh, that's, that's N squared, but we can simplify that problem a little bit by having a lingua franca, which in this case was, was Kafka, that everybody publishes to. And there, therefore now it's an end to one problem of connecting each technology to Kafka and not having to worry about connecting each technology to each other technology. It also tends to simplify your dependency diagrams, et cetera, uh, in, your, in your architecture. Um, so we built out Kafka with a shared uh, Kafka cluster that was in each data center uh, or AWS region uh, in, in cloud terminology. Um, so there was always a local cluster for you wherever you were operating. Uh, and then data between those was replicated between those clusters by explicitly using the uh, Kafka replicator, the Confluent replicator. Um, and the reason for that is trying to deal with all of the different failure modes and problems that one might have, and especially uh, emergent problems that, that, that come from having many different systems communicating over those links, it can get very complicated and you can have some unfortunate effects. Uh, and, and the error conditions that you might run into and that you might need to recover from, they can get pretty involved. It's nice having a tool that fully encapsulates that with just a declarative set of rules that you can set that say, here's how I want to handle all these different failure scenarios, do your best, and know that you know, it's going to do that every single time. Um, and so that simplified a lot of our data movement between data centers. Now, to be fair, we break this rule all the time. Sometimes we do have things that reach out to other data centers. Mostly it's for actually for high availability reasons, uh, but they're, they're more legacy behaviors that we're trying to untangle than they are strategic uh, goals or like, I really want it to work this way. It's not really how I want it to work. Um, we also made sure that we use the schema registry to link all these dis different systems together. Once you're in a streaming context, uh, things get very complicated with schema evolution, right? If you have daily data dumps, you can like write out, here's the schema for today's data dump, and then tomorrow, you, through change management, you post, here's the new schema, and you record it, and then you can read each of the data dumps. But in a streaming context, especially with blue-green deploys, there's gonna be messages in the stream that are using one schema from the old deploy, from the blue system, and you're gonna have other messages that are from the green system, and they're gonna arrive intermingled, right? It's just a reality of how you process them. So you need something like the schema registry that makes that schema evolution a very transparent process, and particularly allows you to act, uh, to develop in a much more agile fashion because you don't have to make sure that every single consumer of the data that you're publishing uh, has to be updated and coordinated, uh, coordinate that update with them before you can release the schema change on the producer side. Uh, we also had some automatic archiving, but I'll skip over that part. Um, we also used a bunch of other tools to make our provisioning and orchestration uh, more abstracted from, uh, from direct stuff that the cloud providers provide. Uh, so we use Terraform, pretty standard tool for abstracting out provisioning. Uh, GitLab CI CD for doing deployments. Uh, we're actually looking at enhance, so we use vanilla GitLab CI CD for most of our stuff, but we're now looking at enhancing that with more sophisticated build and deploy tools in the form of Bazel and Spinnaker, um, which are helping us to have, uh, be able to scale up our operation uh, in, and also have our CI CD run a lot more efficiently and quickly and reliably. Um, and of course, Kubernetes. Um, we, like I said, we delayed on some of this stuff initially. We, Kubernetes seemed a little bit green when, it, uh, when we were first looking at doing this, and so we deferred on it. Uh, we did do a bunch of deployments in the cloud that aren't uh, using Kubernetes, and we're in the process of migrating them all to Kubernetes. But Kubernetes is our big abstraction on whether you're in the private or the public cloud, because we, we have Kubernetes clusters in both, and you design your software to run on Kubernetes and to follow Kubernetes contracts. And that means that I can walk up to a tech lead today and say, you know what? I think it would be a lot better because of these other factors if we ran your stuff in a different cloud than the one you're currently running on. 
and they, they can say, sure, we can deploy that today. Uh, previously, when we weren't using Kubernetes, that was like, sure, we can deploy that next quarter. So this is a big change for us. Um, there's a bunch of additional technologies that we were using to make this architecture all work. A uh, big one was some form of composable functions, particularly lambdas uh, and step functions in AWS. Uh, we're actually looking at adopting the open function as a service standard as a way to give us a little bit more uh, agnostic commitment to composable functions. But this is incredibly helpful because it means that functions that we used to have sort of tightly coupled to a specific workflow are now available as capabilities that we can combine in unique ways as our, you know, I've never met a product manager who doesn't find a way to dramatically change the way you do business from one day to the next. Uh, but that's super frustrating for engineers because they're like, oh, this, all this change, how do I deal with it? Well, by breaking out your capabilities into composable pieces, you basically are giving your product teams and your engineering teams a bunch of Lego building blocks that they can reassemble however they want to. Uh, and that really has been a game changer uh, where we've been able to re-architect things and, and it's kind of a core part of how we refactor at this point. Um, Next.js is uh, a big deal for that push strategy. So using Next.js, we're pre-rendering uh, uh, content based on changes that happen uh, internal systems, like if a ticket gets sold or an event goes on sale, that can be pre-rendered. Uh, like that, that, that event get fires off, a lot of uh, transformation and processing takes place on that, and then it gets pushed out, not just pre-rendered inside a database somewhere, but pre-rendered all the way out to the CDN. So that when you actually send a request to look at an event uh, as much as possible, that work is being served up from the CDN without even touching our systems directly. Uh, so, and normally there's a caching challenge when you try to push everything to CDN. If you've got a push-based strategy, you, the caching problem becomes a lot simpler because you know every change that happens and you can in, it basically replace, it's not even invalidate the cache, you can replace the cache with the new value as each change happens. Um, open tracing was a huge deal for this because obviously if you're moving systems back and forth between public and private cloud, their performance characteristics shift uh, as they're running on different hardware, as they're running on uh, over different network links, uh, and it starts to get very complicated trying to understand the root cause of changes in performance and behavior. Uh, one of the weirdest problems that we've had a few times is we'll make some changes, everything will run faster, and we don't know why. <laughs> it's a terrible plight for an engineer. Uh, and open tracing gives us that transparency to quickly be able to diagnose um, what, what the causal links are and where the behavior and the performance is coming from, even when you have a very complex distributed system like the one that we have. Um, I'll skip through the rest of them pretty quickly, uh, but you know, most of these are technologies that handle that eventual consistency reality uh, and help processing uh, with streams. Uh, Snowflake is particularly uh, key and worth mentioning, I guess, because they give us that elasticity at the database level that you really want from a cloud uh, in, a, in a way that we can't get from even you know, Redshift uh, or, uh, or, or just using a, a, a big database in, in a cloud provider. Um, and that brings me to the last and most challenging problem uh, concept to try to get deployed in terms of our architecture. Uh, and it's sort of implied in a lot of the other things that I've said so far which is with data structures that are known as CRDTs. These are conflict-free replicated data types. Uh, these are data structures that are intrinsically designed to resolve themselves in that, uh, high, uh, that, that uh, high availability but eventual consistency kind of context, which allows you to do things like say, it's possible that this server in this data center doesn't have all of the most recent data because maybe there's been a failure in another system somewhere that's got some state in it that hasn't made it out to it. But it's okay for me to continue to manipulate and mutate that data knowing that when that other bit of data that's locked away somewhere in a failed system comes back online, I can recombine that data and arrive at an actually consistent state without having like a conflict or something that will require me to roll back. Um, this is a difficult uh, and challenging concept to uh, train engineers on that haven't had uh, dist uh, distributed computing uh, expertise in the past. Um, the good part is there's a lot of tools that have built-in equivalents of CRDTs that are nicely abstracted and productized. So Cockroach is 
sponsoring a good chunk of this event. They have a great system that manage, that has CRDTs as intrinsic structures to its architecture. Cassandra does as well. Uh, Confluent does as well in terms of, or Kafka, in terms of how it operates. Uh, Zookeeper, which we use as well, handles, uh, has CRDTs. They all have this kind of mechanism for handling the real physical reality, which is it's not possible to have all the data for any instant in time all in one place because something that's going on, on the West Coast and something that's going on, on the East Coast or more appropriately, something that's going on in Germany and something that's going on in Australia, they just fundamentally, the physics don't allow for those things to, uh, for the information from those things to be in the same place at the same time. You always have to wait. So what are the important lessons that we learned at the end of this experience that um, I didn't mention in terms of problems? So the biggest one is private cloud does not equal public cloud. And, and I wanna emphasize that and go into that a little bit because there was a belief at one point that we really could migrate everything into AWS and we could do it quickly. Um, but we're a company that's been around for 40 years, as you saw on that, on that first slide. And we've been developing software for our technology stack over the course of that time. And as much as um, there's been a symbiotic relationship between that software and our infrastructure, where our infrastructure has evolved to fit our software and our software has evolved to fit our infrastructure. And it turns out that public clouds won't necessarily match the internal evolution that's been going on in your data center for however long you've had your data center. Uh, and as a consequence, um, you might have a piece of software that if you migrate it as is into the public cloud can be tremendously expensive. And yet it was perfectly cheap to operate on, in the private cloud. And Ironically, if you were to reorganize it and restructure it and re-architect it, you could run it on the public cloud for a fraction of the cost that you're currently running it on the private cloud. Uh, easy examples of this is, uh, is like a lot of the serverless stuff, right? So if you can turn something into a bunch of lambdas that are running only periodically, that's extremely cheap to operate. Um, we actually had a URL redirector service, which, you know, your URL redirectors are pretty cheap to operate in, in the worst of circumstances. Um, that we had running on-prem that still cost, you know, I think it was a, like a thousand bucks or something a month to operate. Uh, but when we re-architect, when we first wanted to mo migrate it out into the public cloud, we thought, hey, redirector, easy service, easy to migrate into a public cloud, should be no problem. Well, the cost footprint for that went up like an order of magnitude because you're essentially, it's like you sold your house and then rented it back from a landlord who charges you a big premium for the, the service, right? Um, but when we re-architected it to basically just use S3 and the redirect capability that S3 has with static web surfing, uh, web uh, uh, serving, we went from we went down to a less than 20 buck a month cost, even though we've increased the use of the service by a couple of orders of magnitude since we first deployed it. Um, so it, it's a significant uh, savings just by rethinking and going, wait a minute, if we built it from first principles, knowing we were going to be in the public cloud it would look completely different from how we've implemented it for our private cloud uh, situation. Uh, so that's kind of obvious when you state it, but it's really important for thinking through your cloud migration strategy because the more you've been operating in any particular data center that's different from the cloud you're trying to target, and that might be Google Cloud versus Amazon, it might be Azure versus on-prem, it doesn't really matter what the two are, they're different enough even though they try to try to look as similar as possible, they're different enough that, particularly on a cost dimension, uh, but also on a performance dimension, you might make really, really different choices uh, if you were to optimize for that particular case. And if that turns out to be um, true, you should probably defer making the decision to migrate that service right away. There's probably other services where it doesn't matter so much, and those should be the ones that you prioritize. So you wanna look at your tech stack you want to look at the difference between private and public cloud and go, which of these services would I not rebuild and change how it's architected just for my new target? And then I'll migrate it to that new target first. The ones that I would really rewrite, let's not move them right now. We'll probably run much more efficiently if we leave them where they are because they've been custom built for that particular context. Um, and by the way, at this point, we've been running in the public cloud for long enough that we have a bunch of services that if I was to migrate them on-prem, it would cost significantly more to operate them. So it's not just a one-way uh, uh, problem. Um, there's, there's also this reality that your hybrid cloud adds a lot of complexity. 
Um, and when people talk about doing a migration to the public cloud, um, they often talk about building out a migration plan. I would emphasize that a big part of that though need, requires also a mitigation plan. You should expect that you are about to make everything more complicated for yourself. And while it may ultimately be worth it, you need to start thinking about mitigation strategies for that complexity. Uh, and then the final one is uh, NOOP is a cheat code for Amdahl's law. So a lot of the latency concerns that we had by moving to a push strategy where everything was pre-computed before a request came in, well, now I've broken the Amdahl's law problem because that P there, one minus P becomes zero, right? And it's, it's hard to beat the latency of zero milliseconds. Um, and we were able to pre-compute a lot of our work right out in the edge, uh, sometimes using edge lambdas, sometimes using uh, just static content that we would generate on the fly, sometimes massive amounts of static content. Like we would generate uh, sometimes thousands of web pages from one single change event, and it was still allowed us to scale better because those thousand web pages would be requested millions of times. Uh, and so it allowed us to totally eliminate that latency penalty that we had between our data centers and allow people to perform at significant scale. So that's it. Uh, at this point, I'd open it up for questions. Sure. Yeah, we'll take one. Yeah, we're kind of short on time. Over. I went a little long. Sorry. We're a little sorry. over, but um, kind of wanted to be respectful of both sessions. But here you go. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think you covered a little bit at the end, but I want to double check on this because you mentioned that one of the mistakes that you guys made was that you decided to go all in AWS. Mm -hmm. And is that uh, related to this AWS or on cloud versus on prem and yes. this uh, symbiotic? relationship that you guys had, or was it between AWS and another cloud? Well, it's a little bit of both, right? So like I said, there are realities that you might need to use other cloud providers, and believing that you can only use one cloud provider is kind of a fantasy. Reality will dictate that you use multiple cloud providers. Um, but the bigger one was maybe you don't really want to move 40 years of technology that you've developed and optimized for your on-prem infrastructure as is immediately into AWS without transforming it. That's a bad call. Cool. I'm sorry, because we're, we're a little over, so I want to be respectful sure. of both rooms. So um, yeah, you are around for the rest of the day. Absolutely. There's a break this afternoon. So no if problem. you do have any further questions. Sorry I went a bit over, guys, but oh. I'll hang around in the back there for hallway conversations. It was phenomenal. Thanks, Thank buddy. You. Good. Really, really appreciate it.